Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm very excited to moderate this panel today. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we still have people joining, but we, we will not delay it more than this. So I'm Tara Akavan. I am um, co-founder and chief technology officer of a startup in Montreal called Iris Tech, and I'm volunteering at SID as marketing vice chair for a few years now. So Women in Tech is a new initiative in SID since last year, this is the second year. And um, like every other organization, I have mixed feelings about this. So part of me knows that there are 50% of the population are women. Uh, we occupy 50% of job opportunities and we only sit at 10% of the table. So we have a say probably about 10% on average. So there is a need for such panels to, to talk about um, women in technology, how great they're doing, to educate the new generation, to talk about the risks, how to handle the risks, how to build a career around it. Uh, and on the other side, um, I really wish there was no need for women in tech. We don't have men in tech panels, right? Um, so for now, that we still need women in tech and there's a huge gap, um, please welcome me, for, please join me in welcoming our four amazing panelists uh, today on the panel. Robin Burrell, founder and chief product officer at Red Flight. <laughs> Poppy Crom, chief scientist at Dolby and adjunct professor at Stanford University. Welcome. Rosalie Hu, CEO at uh, LX Wireless, welcome. <laughs> Nadia Ichinomia, uh, Director of IT at Sony Pictures. She's also the founder of Women in Tech Hollywood. <laughs> so, I'll sit down as well. Uh, let's start with a quick intro. We can do a two to three minute intro. You can tell us about your story, your background, how you got where you are today. We will start with you, Nadia. Uh, my name is Nadia Ichinamiya, and like you said, I work for Sony Pictures in the technology group. Um, I've been there for about 11 years. Uh, I started my, um, I started at USC, Fight On. And um, I was a business major there. Uh, I moved to IBM, and I was in sales for about five years, and then moved to Germany. Uh, I speak fluent German. I'm half Ger Japanese, half German. Uh, I spent two years as vice president of EDS Germany, and then decided to, uh, the natural thing for me to do was uh, move to Hollywood and become a producer. <laughs> um, so I, I did that um, and became a TV producer. Uh, and then decided to go back into more on the business side uh, with MGM, and then later on with Sony Pictures in technology. Uh, and I'm also an activist. Four years ago, my co-founder and I started Women in Technology Hollywood. We have 1,600 members, and we're growing quickly. Um, that's about it. But Thank you. You want to continue, Rosalie? Uh, my name is Rosalie Hull. Actually, I'm originally from China. Um, I was um, working for an American company called Amazon for 21 years before I moved to U.S. Um, I started as an engineer and I've been a sales role job. And then I take, leader, take my first leadership position at, at the age of 29. That time I also be very proud to be a mom. Um, I took seven years uh, from um, a small manager to a business leaders for Amazon China. Actually, my last role in Amazon China is to manage the 300 million U.S. business. And then in the 2016, I decided to move to U.S. And that time, I uh, get a chance to take job as the CEO of Elix Wireless, the company I'm um, Working right now, actually, it's a startup um, from 2013, uh, spin off from UBC. Uh, it's an amazing technology for wireless charging. And I'm going, if I have a chance, I'm going to share more information. Thank you. Thank you. 
Poppy, please go ahead. <laughs> yes, hi. I'm Poppy Crum. I'm chief scientist at Dolby Laboratories and uh, adjunct professor at Stanford. Uh, my role, I've been at Dolby for about eight years now. And before I joined Dolby, uh, I'm actually a computational neuro, I'm a neurophysiologist. I was research faculty in the medical school in, in biomedical engineering at Johns Hopkins. Um, my work at Stanford, even though I'm at Dolby, focuses on sort of the immersiveness of uh, the, the capabilities of immersive technology and gaming to sort of change our brains and the neuroplastic um, aspects of how we intersect with our technology and the impact it has on our bodies and how we interact with the world. Um, but that's not where I started. <laughs> um, I go way back, and I actually, my undergrad, I, was a, I went to a music conservatory. I'm a violinist, and I was a violinist and an engineer. And uh, realized while I was uh, a musician, I, always, I was always interested in the other things. I, always, I worked at radio stations, I worked at NPR, the local local version, and uh, you know, spent a lot of time making records on the side just because it was kind of my passion and realized I, I have absolute pitch. So every sound I hear, I can write it down. It's, it's kind of a party trick. It's very annoying if you are a musician because it means you hear your own, your brain, it's hard to, you, have, you spend your time trying to turn your own brain off so that you can make sure you're in tune with everyone else. And because of that, I started taking neuroscience classes. and. Uh, sort of fell in love with um, science from neuroscience and uh, my physics classes I was taking and followed that path of starting out and realizing there was a different level of reduction I kept trying to get to that I wanted to solve a problem at. So I went from uh, being a, mu uh, a violinist, I'm still a violinist, to uh, I did a master's degree in experimental psychology, then uh, my PhD is in neuroscience, and then went on and did, uh, studied biomedical engineering and, and many other things. And I'm, I'm really happy bringing this together with technology because there's uh, that uh, complement of the future right now is, is very powerful. So Amazing. Thank you. thank you. Robin, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, hello everyone and welcome. My name is Robin Burrell. I am the Chief Digital Product Officer at Red Flight and also the founder. Uh, my story starts at also having graduated from USC, so I, I'm in my old stomping grounds, it's great. Uh, but I studied cinema and television. I went to USC Film School and I never expected myself to be in working in tech. Although it makes sense because even when I was very little, I was always the one who was setting up the cable, programming the time on the VCR, making sure that the electronics were working in the house, fixing the air conditioner. I always had like a, a tendency towards tinkering with uh, appliances and kind of mechanical engineering 101 type stuff. So um, I ended up having my first part of the cur my career in film and TV, what I went to school for, and I worked as an apprentice for Oliver Stone and Sam Raimi, and I worked for Miramax, and worked on a lot of films that many people call their, their favorite movies. But because I started very young, I also kind of saw the entertainment industry for what it was at a very early age, and I knew that I wanted to do more. So while I was very successful by the age of 25, I knew that there was something bigger out there, and little did I know was how big technology was going to be in all of our lives, because this was before the iPhone, which I think kind of revolutionized everything. So during kind of that transition period where I was trying to figure out how I wanted to create a bigger impact on the world, I had been doing a lot of philanthropy throughout, throughout my life, my short life at the time, but you know, doing a lot of volunteer work and things like that in the community. So I applied to be an ambassador of Goodwill and Peace, which is a privately funded ambassadorial ship through Rotary, and ended up serving a two-year term in Mexico where I launched a nonprofit program for kids to teach them arts and humanities and dance and literature and poetry, but then also did a lot of work in the community and met with diplomats and heads of state and traveled throughout Mexico this, not to go into too much like political detail, but this was around the time when NAFTA was kind of falling apart for Mexico, thriving for Canadians, not so much Mexico, so my job was to kind of build amnesty with the, with the country. Anyway, kind of fast forward, I ended up getting back into the professional world, kind of after my short stint of finding myself through philanthropy, and I got scooped up by Sony and worked for Sony Electronics. And I think this was truly the beginning of my pivot when I look at my career from media into tech. 
because everything that followed after that became a tech oriented position. Now I didn't study computer science. As I mentioned, I went to film school, but I was programming websites in my free time. And I didn't even know what a computer science degree was. I just knew that I loved what this new world of online and digital was becoming. Um, so while I was, I, I ended up working at Sony Electronics for a bit in Mexico City, came back here to the States. And shortly thereafter, I got picked up by a small social network called MySpace. And I was the second employee on the mobile team there and ended up working there for several years, building MySpace from the ground up in mobile, launched it in over 36 countries across Microsoft and BlackBerry and uh, Apple and Google and kind of saw this whole new promise of an online identity that each of us were is starting to create through our mobile devices. Um, so that really was my entree into tech. And uh, it was kind of birthed by fire because again, I didn't have a formal degree in it, but because I was working at one of the largest startups at the time, you learn a lot by just being boots on the ground at a company like MySpace. So I went on then after that to join Match.com where I was the head of mobile. Um, I ended up authoring a patent that powers Tinder. So um, really have always been kind of at the start of some, something big. I don't know if it was coincidence or luck, but uh, was there for a bit and then ended up joining Amazon. And what really became interesting was after working for all these major tech companies, I felt a gap in fulfillment and empowerment and leadership. And I decided to do something absolutely crazy and insane, which is be an entrepreneur and start my own company. And here I am today. And it's, it's been great and been doing a lot of great projects. Hopefully, we'll have a chance to talk about some of the stuff that we're all doing now. Definitely. Thank you very much. So I love contradictions. We talked about all the glory of your career path, all the achievements. Immediately after that, I want to jump into your biggest mistakes, your lessons learned, what you learned, what was the biggest career point, tipping point for you in your career. Um, I'll start with you, Nadia. Um, great. Well, let's see. I. I, I tend not to dwell on my mistakes or failures because I really feel that every memory I have has brought me, or every incident that, that, that I've had has brought me to this point. It'd be hard to erase that and unravel it. Um, but in terms of one thing that I have discovered um, later in life than, and I kind of wish I had known earlier was, um, I, I, as half, half Japanese, half German, there was really no culture I ever... It's already confliction there. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was always um, hard for me to fit in anywhere. Um, and I tried to do that a lot, you know, but I didn't really fit in with the Japanese culture and I didn't fit in with the German culture. And, and so once I was able to kind of own who I am, then uh, things became a lot more relaxed for me. And um, I didn't have to try and strive to be something that, I, that I'm not. Uh, and instead, I could just um, not be afraid of who I am and not be afraid of my power uh, as a woman. And, um, and it's just made me a lot happier. Um, so that was one of the things that I've, I've learned over time was... Um, to accept yourself as you are. Be yeah, happy with it. And, and kind of like, I think of like my early years as like living incognito to who I really am. Um, so that's when I, when I'm a young, I'm around young people, I always say, you know, show up minute one with who you are versus trying to pretend you're something that you're not or pushing things down that you're not. Yeah. So earlier, um, we had a, we had a quick chat about um, how women in leadership and power positions sometimes try to try to fit in and try to mimic how men do the leadership. How and, and that is very bad because it becomes the same. It, it's the same thing. It's not the nature. The, the whole reason that we need diversity is because we want women to bring all those aspects of womanhood, which is not there uh, on the table. So I know Poppy, this is this is topic which is close to you. Um, Sure. Do you have anything to add there? I mean, uh, sure. I mean, I, th I think that fits into some of the things I would have said. 
I definitely believe not just about gender, but about anything that we have to, you know, technology's future is, has to be about personalization. It has to be about optimization of our context, of our individual qualities. And that, you know, technology, we don't want it to be assistance to us. We want to, you know, technology to be, a, you know, move towards an extension of our own agency. And we want to assure robust experiences for everything that we, that, that, that we, we create. But the same goes for how we interact with each other, and the same goes for recognizing those differences. Um, you know, so, so at the core of the things I believe is that we do have to be, you know, embracing those differences and recognizing that one size doesn't fit all. Which, which kind of gets to you asked me to come up with my, uh, you know, sort of big yeah, learning point a transition in my my career, and there isn't a particular anecdote I'll give. But what I will say is there, there, there's a, a pivot point for me. In, with regard to uh, a mind shift. And you know, I, I, mean, I think we're all strong-willed people up here we, and, and in the audience. And, and there was a point at which I, sh I switched from, you know, and, and started, you know, time is our most precious thing. And it isn't, whether we're in business or anywhere, and it just frankly is the most precious thing we have. And every interaction we have with someone, that communication, I, w I you know, I like to be right in places, but it's not about right or wrong. It's about whether the information and the data that you care to exchange with someone is actually experienced and taken in in the way that you want, want it to be. And it was a really pivotal point where I, I stopped making it about, you know, a two, that it was up to someone else to make sure that that happened. It's, you know, it doesn't matter what's happening on the other side. It is my job to make sure that what I want to, you know, what I care about being exchanged in that, you know, when I'm talking to someone else or I'm presenting, is experienced on the other side. And that comes in lots of different shapes and sizes. And when you own that, it means that, you know, you, you, other people might not be bringing their best, but you know, that doesn't matter. It's your job. And the, the real thing then you have to recognize is that, you know, as much as we have this cliche that we want to always bring our, our best and you want to, you know, know how to bring your best to every day and every interaction and everything you do, that just ain't reality. And it's not possible when you've got a lot going on. You know, what, you, what, what I shifted towards is, look, I've got to know how to make sure that when I am at my absolute worst, I'm still good enough and I'm still okay in making sure that what I'm doing is being shared because frankly, I probably haven't had enough sleep. I've got too much going on and I've, I might not be prepared. Maybe I, I've cared for two parents who have passed away. I've, you know, I have a daughter. I've got a lot of things in my life and I don't want those on the table in my interactions and I don't want someone else to feel them. And I do a lot of, you know, and, I, and so I started thinking about that as how do I train myself to know, to be my own self-critic, to know if I'm going to be able to handle it. Because if I can't, if I know what it feels like to be at my worst, I know when to say when I have to say no. And that's way better than trying to push through. You know when you have to step back. But I also know how to make sure that I, I can feel that. You know, I, I mean, I, quick, a couple examples are, you know, I do a lot of public, I, I, if I'm giving a talk, you will see that hour before or even hours before. I try to make myself as nervous as possible. I, I plan for what if I don't sleep? What if I, you know, what if things go in a different direction? What if I get a, a, an email from work that has my brain in a different place? I have to know how that feels so that I can still deliver what I need to deliver because nobody else needs to have that part of me with them. And so training myself to be that way, one of the, the, the piece of advice I often give um, to my students or to anyone is, you know, go run a marathon, but but not after you've trained. Go run it tomorrow. I promise you will finish. And the point is, it's 26 miles. We can all go walk 26 miles. Think of it as a giant street fair. People are going to give you food and water every. You know, they're going to like shower you with confetti every mile. And you know, just know what it feels like, because you're going to get in that. What you're going to get is you're going to know how, what it takes you to recover. And that's, that's really important. You're going to know what that, what that time horizon looks like, what your time series looks like, and the things that help you do it. And then you're slowly, and you're, and you're going to finish, and you're going to know it's not about the 26 miles. It's about all those mundane pieces where you feel really awful and horrible, but actually you don't because you recover. And, and knowing your recovery and knowing how to bring that is like the best skill. Like I draw upon it all the time. I've, I've run a lot of marathons, but the ones that have taught me the most are the ones where I was out of shape. And um, I think that's you know, it, it, Thank it's, you. It's part of that mindset. Yeah, I love that analogy. Uh, Robin, do you want to take uh, this question as well and tell us maybe the biggest lesson learned or the mistake that you made, which was which taught you something that you would like to share with us? 
Sure. Well, I agree with Nadia. I don't think there's any mistakes because everything that in the moment I perceived was my world falling apart or a bad decision was just life showing me what I really needed to know and learn. And so without those mistakes, I probably wouldn't be here. So I don't regret any of it. If I can give kind of some areas that I wish I was better in, um, you know, I do regret, and this was, you know, LinkedIn has kind of changed all this and social media, but I think back to all the amazing people I've met over the course of my career and who I've lost touch with. And so, and it's easy because we're constantly in the, in the now, we're being pulled by something that we think is happening in the future. And the only time we look back is for regrets, but there's so much in, so many p great people in our past that we shouldn't lose contact with. So I do, when I think back, I think, oh gosh, I wish I didn't lose touch with this person. So I would say that's one thing. Um, I would say, you know, I've had times in my career where I felt alone in something that was happening at my job, whether it was some form of discrimination or unfairness or some sort of injustice. And I kind of, I would flee the scene, either emotionally and mentally or literally leave the job. And I think that now we're in a, a space, a collective consciousness that's a shift is happening where women, people of color, or young people, ageism, people who are at kind of at the very senior part of their career, don't have to be afraid to stand up for themselves when they see problems happening in the workplace. And it's a real advantage of living in today's world because I feel as though even five years ago, you know, certain circumstances happened in my career where I didn't feel as though I had a voice. So I don't know if I regret it because I don't know if I would have been in a supportive space to be able to kind of say, hey, that's not fair, or this happened to me and I think there should be some action taken, but I think now we're at the precipice of that all being changed. So I would encourage anyone that feels afraid or feels as though there's some sort of discrimination in their workplace to really be able to voice that now. I would hope, because I'm starting now to, to defend others that I see not being treated fairly, so. Yeah, that's yeah. a great point. Um, religion, background, stereotypes, yeah. women of color, people of color. Yeah. Uh, being minority in any aspect has, mm -hmm. has all those points, like all the me too, thumbs up, action. I'll, I'll go back uh, to that point with Nadia and I'll discuss uh, something you did. But before I do that, I want to go back to Rosalie and um, get maybe a lessons learned or a big mistake you did in your career, if any. Okay. Of course, um, we all have those kind of lessons to learn in our career. Uh, the most things I'm thinking of, um, if time back I can do it differently, is um, back to like my age of middle uh, 13s. So um, at the afternoon, my boss come to my office, says, why not you take a big role? Um, that time I'm only the uh, leader for a business unit, which is about 5% of the company. And my boss want my to take basically the second chair of the company. It's about at least 30% uh, of the revenues of the company. And at the moment, I'm just thinking, no, I don't want to take it. Um, I've been that business unit for more than 10, almost 10 years. And then I'm familiar with every corner of that business. I know every person in factory, on the market, the uh, hold major customers, and my managers work with me for more than five years. We all know each other. So we kind of like a family. I don't want to leave my family. That time I'm sought. Um, but um, although finally I take that job, I took that job, and I'm running really successful that one. So everyone has his own comfortable Zoom. But when you have chance to get a big role, I'd like to say the outside world is colorful. So you will get more um, chance to see the colorful world. So if you got chance to do that, grab it. Don't let person to push you, especially your boss. That's the thing, so I am trying to catch every opportunities, not only for myself, also for my team. Yeah, that's also very close to my experience because uh, I think, I don't know if there is a, a 
neurological reason for this, or it's education or environment, but women tend to take risk less than men, and they tend to feel like they need to be more qualified, sometimes overqualified for a position for, to, to jump for that. And Nadia, uh, you have an experience, similar experience when you moved to Germany, right? Do you wanna share that story with us briefly? Sure, uh, so I, I think what it is actually is culture. Um, in the Indian culture and the Chinese culture, I think that STEM fields are more encouraged. Um, we've worked with a lot of uh, outs, you know, um, companies in India and where they have a third of their engineers are female. So, um, so I do definitely think the culture has a, a huge impact on that. Um, so yeah, back in um, back when I was working in EDS Germany, I, I had the opportunity to take on a role that uh, that I was um, pretty underqualified for in a way. I it was in my I think I was about 26, and the role I took on was uh, vice president of EDS Germany, um, and all the other vice presidents were. Uh, in their 40s, 20 years older than me, and um, German and male. And, uh, you know, I, I, I looked at it like, what can I bring to the table that hasn't been done before here and is not faking something? Because I'm not into being... Um, you know, trying to... F I hate the fake it till you make it expression. I can't stand that expression. Um, but so what I did was I, I turned the traditional leadership model, which is the pyramid of the person at the top and then the pyramid going down, I turned that upside down. It's called servant leadership. Uh, and I basically put myself at the bottom and then I put everyone that reported to me as the experts. And they really were because I moved from IBM selling hardware and software to uh, an EDS, which is a services business, very different. Um, and, you know, I just... Whenever there was like, okay, Nadia, like you're here to save the day, I said, no, actually, I'm not. You are here to save the day. Let's. What would you do? What are your ideas? And um, that became really effective. Um, and so it's it's something. The servant leadership model is something that I, I, I lived, and I had to live it that way because I really, like I said, was underqualified for the job. Um, but it. In, on the court, it worked really well uh, to make the people that worked for me the experts because they could solve the problems and they, they were the experts. Uh, and so um, that's something that I wanted to, to share is something that was, that was pretty great. Thank you. Um, Rosalie, you're a CEO of a startup right now with all the ups and downs. I leave that. Um, so they say CEOs, the CEO job is the loneliest job on the planet. Um, so how do you, how do you manage that? Like, uh, what are some of the challenges that you have in this new role? It's a few years that you took on this role, right? Um, maybe you can touch base on managing your board. Um, how does that work? There are not so many women, uh, that have a seat there. So whatever you want to share as challenges there for the audience. Uh, yeah, I've been this job for two years almost. So yes, I totally agree. CEO is most lonely job in the world. So um, as my previous uh, career, I always had some mentor on that. So she's, he's kind of uh, can um, everything you know in the job side you can rely on, um, even uh, just for the spirit side. Um, but right now, um, as a CEO, I always describe this job like you are a driver to drive a vehicle. So your team is just like uh, the other components of the vehicle. So you need to make the direction of your company. And uh, you can't rely on anyone to do that. You are, um, you are the brain of your uh, company. So, but you still have a lot of things you are not familiar with. You need to make the decision, some kind of you lack of the knowledge. So what I'm thinking about is I'm kind of cut this mantle um, to small pieces. For example, I, I didn't have any fundraising experience, but as a startup, you should do that. 
So I'm targeting uh, my chairman as my mentor for that. But also for the technology side, uh, for Elix, our technology is no one did before. We basically, we are innovation something. But you have to rely on the people, your team on technology side, especially for the technology inventor for that. Also for the market, because this is widest charging things, you don't have to copy a model from market side. You need to develop the market by yourself. So um, sometimes, you know, you can acquire talent from the other company, but not 100%, because we did things people never done before. So kind of this, um, um, uh, to make a company to moving forward a little bit at this moment. Thank you. I want to change the topic a little bit. Um, Poppy, you teach a class. You, you teach many classes at Soundboard. You're an adjust, adjunct uh, professor. Uh, and one of the challenges I feel always is that um, recently we have women in tech funds. So there, there is money for, um, for women entrepreneurs to, to found companies to come and bring new uh, ideas to the industry. But I don't think there are enough of them out there, or they, they accept the risk, or just they kind of jump on the opportunity as we touched on, uh, touched based on it before. How do you feel, how do you, how do you see this among your students? And, and uh, what do you do about it? What do you do about it is the, the thing I think we all Real should be question. talking about. Um, we can give it, we can talk platitudes and advice all we want, but we actually gotta change, get, make sure we actually make, do, do the things we believe. I know you have, uh, you have an absolute pitch, but I'm going to ask you to, to so speak up. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so I agree. Uh, something that Rosalie, I really like that you said, which I think feeds into Tara's question, is um, you know, this, this concept of loneliness. And it, it scares a lot of people away. Loneliness and the unknown. And um, you know, I, I have a, a couple of sayings. Again, I like those. <laughs> but um, that you know, I feel you ha when you're thinking about te you know, technology, not just as a CEO, but when you're trying to be ahead of ideas and you're in that space where you're looking for how things are gonna change or you wanna be at the cusp of something, you have to be confident being lonely in your ideas because you know, if everyone understands them and that is, you know, by that time you're probably late, right? If you have to be thinking about things that everybody, even in your own company for sure, is not going to understand or support. And in that way, you have to develop this confidence to be your own worst critic. You know, so you have to be insecure at yourself, but then you have to know how to be confident that you've done that and you've thought through it. And you can then be very, you know, take that confidence with you, even if, you know, and in, in, in that you've scrutinized, scrutinized yourself in the right way and you know who you, the people, you know, how to trust you know, input and, and feedback, but at the same time, that might not be the only source of information. A lot of it has to come from you and your own insights. So, you know, in that way, at my, I, I do, I teach one class at Stanford, otherwise I'm full-time at Dolby, <laughs> and then, and, but I, I teach a coding class. I mean, really my class is about, you know, that my students come in and they, they code a ton of things. It's, it's a lot of coding, it's a lot of game development, but, you know, we're thinking about immersive technologies. They're building for any, uh, you know, current immersive technology, you know, or game controller or VR, AR. But the point is that I have, that's, in, that's interesting here is I purposely put no requirements on my class. And my reason for that is I don't want people to feel they need to have a requirement coming in. We're going to make sure we get them to some place that they can, and it, it does help balance diversity and or make sure there is diversity in ways that I think wouldn't necessarily be there. And you know, that, like, something I've said before is you, know, you want to think who you want to be and what you want to know, and then put yourself there. Don't think about what you've done in the past. You don't need to have, you know, there are so many things that come together, and I often tell people this, it's you, know, you never know when you're learning something, whether it's going to be, you know, it doesn't need to be the thing you do 10 years from now, but it's gonna be a critical part of that tool belt, whether you're a CEO and you're having been a fundraiser in the 10, 20 years ago, that's gonna be something you draw upon. And I, I can think about 25 years ago, I, was, I, I soldered circuit boards for one of the designers of the original developers of the synthesizer. 
simply because I wanted to have interesting chats with him, you know, and, and I, I relish that, but, you know, I, I didn't want to care about soldering, but when then I had to build my own lab at Hopkins, you know, because nobody shows up to do that for you, it, it was like, oh yeah, I know how to do that, I know what I have to do, and it's just this, this tool I can draw upon that gives me autonomy to build the things I want to do and to not feel fettered by it. And so in that same way, with students, and especially the female students that might come in, I, I want to make sure that they have those tools and that they're developing each one of them, even if it's not what they do in their future. They're gonna, there's going to be some aspect of that confidence build that they've gotten through there that gives them insight. My students build brain-computer interfaces and they walk away, you know, in one week, they walk away knowing that they did that, and I like that. So. All right, thank you. I was uh, reading an article a while ago that was saying in 1980s, um, the admissions for computer science uh, was actually 50-50 with, with women and men, but in 2014, it's 2080. So there, there is definitely a cultural point, point into that. There is stereotypes that women cannot develop, they are not good coders. Um, I have a computer engineering uh, degree, and I'm not a good coder, by the way, the, to, to fit into that stereotype, but I don't code, right? So you can be a technologist without coding. Uh, and I want to kind of marry this discussion to what we were discussing before, Robin, uh, on, um, on you going through a non-tech to a high-tech transition. You were not, you didn't study computer science, you studied film, and you ended up in a high-tech community, and maybe you can share a bit of your story about the transition and how uh, you do code, actually. You were coding before that. Um, yes, yes, I was. I was coding in HTML, self-taught. But you're right, I didn't have any formal training whatsoever. And when you go into companies like Amazon um, or IAC, who is the parent company of Match.com and Tinder and a lot of other dot, big dot-com websites, you know, engineers don't really see that as enough. Just because you're self-taught in a couple of programming languages doesn't make you at their level. So. Respect is a big thing in tech organizations, as I'm sure many of us have experienced. And in order to kind of have that street cred and um, you know respect from your peers, you do have to do a lot to to get there. Um, you know, for me, I had been successful in roles at major tech companies that got me at least you know half of the way there in terms of respect and credibility but it took my performance and being able to you know participate in scrum meetings and understand what agile pro you know pr product management is and all these different you know protocols and philosophies and building software that i had to really understand at a high level of proficiency in order for engineers to even listen to me but at the same time i think and this is really important for anyone wanting to get into tech or you're kind of on the outskirts of it and some other kind of ancillary or support role or you're at a tech company but doing something traditional in terms of finance and marketing is that the, everyone always talks about STEM and everyone's pushing kids into coding. You know, I myself do that. I'm, I host coding workshops for kids, but I don't push them into coding. I push them into tech and there's a difference because there's so many roles. I mean, as you can see from this diverse panel up here that are, go beyond the coding uh, the, the coding framework or as a computer software engineer. There's you know, social media management, there's database engineering, there's project management, um, you know, there's network infrastructure, there's UI and UX, whether it's the user interface or the user's journey you know, from page to page, that comes from having a little bit more of a creative mindset or a background in psychology. And so I think a lot of kids are going into coding they, just like math, they get scared off when it gets really tough and then they don't wanna have anything to do with it. Just like a lot of adults who don't even like math because of these traumatic experiences they had in high school with it. And so I, I'm starting to see that in, in coding too and it's a real tragedy because there's so many lucrative careers that can get young people into the six figure zone without having to write a single line of code. And that's really what we should be teaching our kids is that you know, tech isn't just sitting in front of a computer by yourself, not interacting with anyone all day and staring you know, at syntax. It's really so much larger than that and it's right for any type of personality and any type of skill set. So you know, I'm living proof of that but there's so many other people out there that are living proof of that, but just that people don't see. So, yeah. Thank you. 
Uh, Poppy, do you want to share your story from going, uh, I think you, you started as a scientist, right? Uh, and then you ended up as a technologist at Dolby, kind of. So I, I how, think I'm how a little did bit happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, and I just actually want to comment on Robin. I love your thoughts. At the same time, I really think that there is, you know, coding is not difficult for people to engage in and build basic things. You know, I can take people who haven't coded before and, you know, start them with almost drag and drop coding to the point where they can, you know, build a basic synthesizer or do something. And having the dialogue helps give a mental representation that will likely make them more effective. I think even if they're coming from backgrounds and, you know, and it's we, right now, I think part of why leading in, it's leading into the question that Tara just asked, which is, you know, I came from, I, I'm a neurophysiologist, I was in biomedical engineering department, and I literally got my funding, my, my PI funding, which means that you get your labs and things and everybody's happy and you're happy, and I woke up really ecstatic about that, and then a few days later realized that I wanted to be working on slightly different problems and I wanted to move faster and I wanted to pivot and I wanted to be building things that actually were gonna reach people and touch people in you know, the near term and in the time frame that, that, that I was thinking, you know, that, that I was going to experience. And at this time, you know, this is, I've been at Dolby eight years, there is something happening which is, is pretty you know, formidable with regard to how our lives are going to change. And, and that's that you are seeing the computational power of you know, very progressive machine learning and deep learning you know, be able to live on very tiny chips and, and be part of all of our technologies. Well, you know, the world I come from, computational neuroscience, we've been thinking and working in machine learning and probabilistic models of our sensory experience, because that's, that's where I think, you know, for, for a long time. And it's now, you know, what I was seeing is that this was going to be evolving into how our technologies are intelligent to us and can really, you know, enhance our sensory experiences in ways that are quite progressive. And that was extremely exciting. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, eight years ago, someone might have asked me, well, wait, how, how does that relate to technology? And I think today, it's like, it is what the future of technology is. And most companies have people that come from backgrounds and, and think in these ways, and we have to. And so it's just, it's, you know, there's, there's this wonderful sort of proliferation of, you know, caring about our sensory interactions and thinking about technologies that interact with us. And that means we've got to get these experiences right. It's really what I call embodied user experience where your technology knows what you're experiencing on the inside and it, you know, it's this really um, thoughtful, progressive, empathetic exchange. Thank you. So Nadia, do um, Hollywood women in tech code? Can they code? <laughs> yes. So we I have. I want you to to like tell us a little bit. What about Robin that. said, um, you know, there are so many different jobs out there, and uh, I'd love to love to talk to uh, kids from you know kindergarten on and ask them what they think, you know, what their favorite apps are, and um, like what they think you need to study in order to to participate in in creating any of that and. And their answers are, are very interesting because it's always like math and engineering and science. And, and then I kind of point out, well, one of the people I work with uh, has a music degree in composition. Or I'll talk to another per you know, one of my other colleagues is a psychologist or another colleague is, uh, uh, you know, an artist. So, um, and, I, and I think that, that uh, in order to you know, put together the best user experiences. Having empathy is also really important. And um, so, so, so it's, I, I always find it interesting to talk to kids to see how early that programming starts with that um, only one type of person uh, creates technology and it's actually quite, quite uh, eye-opening. Um, so in our women in technology group, we have uh, 1,600 women and men from all the different studios. And um, you know, many of them have never coded in their life. And some of them, some of them have, and, and the languages that, uh, that they started in perhaps are, are archaic these days. <laughs> Fortran, et cetera, COBOL. Um, but uh, I, think, I think for, for me, my experience has been that um, 
that having curiosity is super uh, important and, and looking at the world and, and going, okay, well, how would I figure that out? And also having an opinion about something. Um, so we have, uh, like I said, 1,600 women and men that, um, that comprise this women in technology group. Um, and uh, we have this exciting initiative called Solve for Equality by 2025 in Hollywood and Technology. Uh, and we're creating it right now that within seven years we want to disrupt discrimination, racism, and bias in technology in Hollywood, which right now are, you know, they're not the most open, accepting um, industries, and they both are fraught with. <laughs> didn't affect them at all. Like, nothing happened. They are all working. Right. Like half of Hollywood is not working today. Right. So there's definitely some really, um, really big challenges. But I, I, I firmly believe in the dignity of the human spirit. And I think that um, when you do have many different voices at the table, there's really nothing that can't be solved. And, um, you know, when you think of gay marriage at the beginning of the Obama administration, even Obama was against gay marriage. Uh, and then within, within two terms of his, his, um, his presidency, it was passed as a federal law. And that had so much to do with the entertainment business and bringing in um, into, our, into our living rooms characters from Modern Family and Will and Grace. Um, so I think the power of the entertainment industry is really amazing. Uh, and then the technology industry, uh, you know, having these crazy, you know, making water on Mars or, uh, you know, sending... Tesla too. Right. <laughs> sending men to the moon. Uh, in, in Tesla. <laughs> well, even in the 60s, uh, when they hadn't invented the mat metal alloys for, for that, that first moon launch. So um, I think both these industries can be really potent uh, solvers of these issues that they're fraught with. Um, and so I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future. Thank you. Rosalie, I'm going to ask the last question from you, and then we'll take questions from the audience. I'm very excited that we have a very diverse audience. I think we have more men than women. Uh, that's amazing. Can we capture this from here, cameras? <laughs> so um, before we get to the audience, Rosalie, we, we touched base on, um, on cultural differences. Um, you have worked as, as leaders. Uh, we have the president of the SID taking picture of the audience. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, Rosalie, you have been in leadership positions in China and in, in the US. Um, you do businesses with, with different cultures. Um, what do you see there? Already not yet touch point, and it, this resonates with my experience of um, leaving and working in Asia when, when I felt it's more diverse. When I moved to Europe, I thought it would get better. It got worse. When I got moved from Europe to, to North America, I was sure it's getting better, and it got way worse. So, um, so what is your experience? What do you think of the cultural differences? And then in Alex, is there anything you guys are doing about this? Um, of course, there's cultural difference, uh, especially uh, between China and North America. And uh, fortunately, um, I work with America company, as I uh, explained before, for 21 years. And right now, although I'm managing a North America company, and uh, our last shareholders is from China. And uh, I have two of seven board sheets from China. So that's kind of mix from Chinese and North American. So um, I'd like to say is we need to respect each other's cultures. Um, I'm kind of in between to understand both. Maybe some of that, not, I, I can't say 100%. So acting as a role to keep communication. So um, I always talk my team that communication is most important. I took example that in my Vancouver office, two doctors originally from Canada, they both speak frequent English, but they misunderstand each other. <laughs> that's true, that's very true for our daily life. So as a motor culture companies, it's very important to double check the other's opinion um, when you come to a conclusion. 
and there should be some point you can make it at the end. So don't give up. <laughs> and also I take the advantage of as a woman because I'm, I have another woman um, board members in my organizations. So I think women is some kind of better communication than men. I believe so, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Some of the men in the audience believe so. That Okay, so we will take a few questions. We have like uh, 10 minutes. Please go to the microphone if you have questions. And my, uh, uh, to just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Suptik. I work in Eastman and previously had done my PhD from Kent State at Liquid Crystal Institute. Uh, my question to Dr. Papi Kram and others in the panel, uh, to create a gender equal society which we all desire, uh, which should be the priority that uh, more women get into uh, science and technology and STEM area or more women get into entrepreneurship? Well, <laughs> I think I, I'm not, I can answer a little bit, but I'm really interested. I, I think the key common denominator in both of those statements is more, frankly. Um, it, you know, and I, I would say that, you know, yes, more into, you know, if you look at neuroscience is interesting. If you look at neuroscience, maybe people don't realize it's a pretty much people in terms of gender getting PhDs, it's about 50-50, right? It's actually, you know, and, 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 but there's huge attrition at the point of people getting tenured professors, professorships, and why? I mean, there's things with biological clocks, there's things with you know the tenure process, there's all sorts of things that happen that cause that, and you can fix those things. You have to do them more systemically, for sure. Um, but the one thing I would say is, you know, getting people hired is one thing. Changing, you know, culture and inclusion and how, you know, numbers at the, in, in the room itself it, to me is fundamentally critical. I, I, I'm gonna let you all talk about entrepreneurship, but I really do feel you have to change the numbers in all spaces of how people interact because you know, I, uh, a woman who I know who's uh, for a very large bank is, um, leads all of their sales and she said um, her, her view is if you're you know, under 33%, if you know, gender's on the table. And, but it's not just gender, it's everything. You know, it's just we need diverse opinions. We have different perspectives and it's not, you know, it's how you make sure that you even include individuals that don't think the way you do. And, and there, you know, I think a lot of older c c corporate cultures, you know, forget about gender, forget about diversity, like to include like-minded opinions in the table. And, and once you break that open, you start thinking differently. So I'll pass off. If I may add, I uh, just want to use this opportunity. We have a lot of supportive men in the audience. Um, a while ago, I had two experiences with discrimination. Um, they both affected me a lot, but what I got out of it is it's not just enough to talk about it. When it happens, I think we need everybody around the table to step up. Like, I'm going to share one of, you, one of them with you. We were interviewing for a, for a technical position, and um, the person that we were interviewing was from a specific race. Um, when he left, one of our colleagues who was part of the interview made a comment about, um, yeah, but this, this race are like that. Uh, and and if, if we don't stop that right there, um, I think we are not going to improve this. Just, just having funds for women in, in entrepreneurs or, or talk about LGBT or talk about uh, any minority, different religions, different races, um, people of color, talking about it is not enough. Like we need to stand up when we can and when we are not the target of that, that systematic discrimination. Uh, so we had a very friendly chat after that, that, you know what, I'm more interested in your professional opinion about his CV and the interview. Let's, let's put all those other things aside and we can talk about it maybe outside of a professional environment if you want to, but here that doesn't, doesn't make any sense and it doesn't make a change. So, yeah, please go. Ahead. Tara, I just wanted to make one statement that I, I, I like, and, and I've said this before is, you know, when, when you're in a, a meeting that's a key meeting, you know, there, and you look around and, you know, it, it isn't how you want it to be or you wish it were. You know, you have to think about what, what's happening in that meeting that's so important. It's information's being shared. 
and everything is, you know, success ultimately is about how, you know, in terms of making sure we, you know, improve diversity and we, we break these things, it's about how information is shared more progressively, more demo, you know, how we democratize that better. And that takes work and it takes an, an acknowledgement when those, you know, when there's critical information being shared, is that list the right, you know, have we thought about that? Have we, you know, because if we keep, you know, if you do things by levels, you're probably not including and empowering people to have the information they need to rise up to, to, to be able to bring their ideas to the table. And it's like thinking through how do you, you know, how do you make sure that information, and I'm using information broadly, but I think it's something we need to think about all the time. Definitely. I mean, it, it's a group move, right? All of these changes, it's not going to happen just by women, just by men, just by people of color. It's, it's like a whole society that needs to get more aware and, and act on every single one of them. Um, other questions, I saw some other uh, hands in the audience before? Hello, my name's David. Um, my question to the panel is, uh, each of you, what one thing would you like to see change uh, in our society for more young women to go into uh, STEM industry? Um. So I, I'd like to recommend a couple books. Uh, so one of, the, one of the books that I recommend is a, is a book called Women Don't Ask, which is by um, Sarah Lashiver and, um, I can't remember her first name, Linda Babcock. Uh, and it talks about these cultural um, things that, you know, girls grow up in a certain culture where they are, they're doing babysitting and more like inside the home um, activities to earn money, whereas the boys are mowing the lawns and stuff, and, and you might go out to dinner with your family and you see your, your dad paying for things, and so it's the culture that, that we grow up in is so, uh, it, it's so um, pervasive on, on, you know, the, the magazines that we see that promote, um, you know, that looks are very important for women, and Th those kind of things that we that we just kind of grow up in, and that they're the air we breathe. So that that book has really uh, impacted me a lot in terms of making me aware of of uh, things that I wasn't even asking for in 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 a, in a formal negotiation for salary, but also just um, really very often in in the workplace um, asking for things that I that I didn't think that um, that I could ask for. Um, and the other book that I, that I wanted to recommend was a book called Solve for Happy, which is written by the former uh, chief business officer of Google X, Mo Gaudet. And um, he, he has this engineering approach to solving for happiness. And, and one of the things that was great reading it was um, just it, it strips away a lot of the illusions that we have separating each other. So you mentioned this incident that you had, um, which I found really interesting. And, you know, if that person that was being judgmental in that meeting really realized that, and I know this sounds kind of kumbaya, but it's like we're all sisters and brothers, you know, and, and we all have different opinions and different things we grow up in, but to just kind of embrace that and... Um, and just statistically, people that are happier are more successful. So I just want to put that out there because those were some really impactful books I've, I've read. And I think that if, um, if really any women read those books, but just really anyone, uh, to, get, to get to know what, uh, what women are under, I think men that have read the Women Don't Ask book can have an under, more of an understanding and more empathy for what might be pressing down a woman um, in terms of asking and then bringing her to the table. And then just, uh, and, and just the idea of um, being happier as a person and being more of yourself and uh, bringing that joy to work. Um, you're gonna have more fun, you're gonna attract more to you and you're gonna be yourself. So just wanted to add that. Thank you. Um, I wanna share a book uh, written by um, the previous uh, Amazon uh, chairman and CEO, Chanette. Uh, this book called 25 Years Success in the Paris. So actually I took this as a Bible for my career. So basically you can find a lot of reference uh, when a marketing job 
a market jump and when a new uh, technology innovation, what need, you need to handle um, for your company as well as for your life. We have another question. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, my wife has been very successful in achieving distinction in her engineering field with her professional society uh, at a very high level. Uh, she's tried to migrate into the uh, corporate boardroom with limited success. Um, she's found that she does not receive great support from the very few women that al already occupy such positions. Um, and she often talks about how effective the good old boys network is in, uh, in preserving uh, corporate America within the U.S. as we know it basically a white, white boys club. Um, and I'm sure most of you would probably agree with that. I was oh, yes. <laughs> so I'm a I was sweet spot, right? I'm an immigrant. I was younger when I started. And uh, I'm a woman. So I, I think it's, it's almost the same for everybody, like uh, in terms of a combo that makes it even more difficult. So I was thinking as I was listening to you, it just occurred to me, why not form a good old girls club? You're doing it here. You guys want to join? <laughs> well, no, there, there actually is uh, there is something called the Girls Lounge, which is uh, it's for women. It's started by a friend of mine um, called Shelly Zalis, and she has this group called the Girls Lounge, and they put together women um, women groups at traditionally. Uh, very male-oriented events like uh, the CES or the World Economic Forum. So I would definitely urge you to uh, look her up. Her name is Shelley Zellis, and her group is called um, the Female Quotient. Uh, and her her one of her groups is called the Girls Lounge. And they they have basic they have the Good Old Boys Network, and that's fine. And um, but there also is the Girls Lounge, which men are very much invited to. So uh, that is. Not really the antidote, but it's just another another group. Um, so I'd urge you to look into that, and it's a wonderful, wonderful group. That, that, that I think that's really important. The one thing I will say is there's you, you struck a chord a bit with me because those types of you know um, if it's, it's within that you know that the, you like people of like minds are having you know, there's something there's a word that gets used a lot maybe not in all industry but I definitely hear it a lot. It's relationship, right? I do not like that word. We have got to get rid of the word relationship. It doesn't mean you don't, you don't have people that you work with, that you respect highly. But the concept of a relationship being critical in my work environment, for me, is just fundamentally wrong. And it should be about trust, right? I want to have people I trust. I may have my friends that have similar things, but I actively do not let, it's, it's very interesting, because people who work for me even, they'll, they'll say the word, oh yeah, we're, I'm, I'm building a good relationship. Wait, no, not relationship. I'm building good trust with people. <laughs> and, you know, it's the things that, it, I, mean, I mean, it's an innocuous word, but it fundamentally has a connotation that is inclusive or exclusive and not objective. And I think that it's critical that we actually fundamentally care about these things because otherwise you're only going to proliferate the inclusivity of one group or another group, and that's not what we want, right? We want people to trust each other and to succeed and to have diversity that can come in lots of shapes and sizes and lots of way working styles and a lot of different ways of achieving success. And it's, yeah, you don't all have to get along perfectly. You have to be civil and you have to trust each other and you have to know how to be good humans. Um, Thank you. We probably have time for a last question. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, getting girls into STEM fields and, and how do you bring that younger generation in. Uh, we didn't talk much about the other end of the spectrum, which is uh, the exodus from the STEM field of women who are um, in their 30s and 40s. And then in addition to that, you know, the follow-on question I have is, do you think that women's perceived professional value um, continues to grow at the same rate as, as their counterparts, their male counterparts, as they get older? Are they perceived as valuable? Um, and, and how do you handle that? How do you address that? 
So I, I would love to address that, because I was actually going to bring that up with one of the earlier questions. For the sake of time, I didn't go, go, go there. But it is a major, major issue of retention. Once women have made it past them, they've got these great careers, they have this great position, hanging on to them is really tough because once they get there, they're in this battlefield against men and this kind of power struggle. And a lot of women just after, I think I, I read a, a really fascinating study that you know the average amount of time in tech companies for women is about four years. And if you're a person of color, it's half of that a lot of times in terms of the average because it's so hard once you get there to defend your space and command respect in a male-dominated industry. So it's a major, major issue. I think for me personally, the times where I've been able to ride the wave of that is by having an internal mentor. And that's something that, you know, maybe some people disagree with, but you can't really ask for a mentor. It's like asking someone, you know, to be in a relationship with you. They kind of already, sorry for that word, <laughs> but I mean like- Trust, <laughs> to be in yeah. a trust. In a romantic <laughs> sense. It's like asking someone in a romantic sense, be mine when they're not interested or they're not, you know, available for whatever reason. But it is so critical to have a mentor within these organizations to keep you there, to keep you under your wing, to defend you, to be in the conference room with you and not let everyone mansplain what you just explained quite clearly. And for me, I see my excess success attributed to, you know, to be honest, to white males who took me under their, their wing in every company. I've never had a mentor that was a female and I've never had a mentor that was a person of color which is sad, but still, you know, white males, Indian males, Asian males have always been there to help me and make sure I stayed. And so I encourage, you know, not just the white males in this room, but everyone in this room to kind of just be present to someone who may not seem happy in their role or may be struggling or not kind of falling out of interest in the role because they're probably bumping up against these statistics, and I really find the only solution, because HR, I'm sorry, HR, they're not gonna help you. It really is your boss and your leader making sure you stay, and otherwise we lose so many good women, and then it's even harder if they do leave to go start families, unless there's someone there championing them back, it's really hard to make that entrance, that re-entry back into tech. It's a major, major issue. I'm glad you brought it up. Thank you. I, I was one thing we were talking about is I have a rule to myself is when I think about because I, I actually got my not my company added six to eight weeks to everyone's maternity and paternity leave because I showed up with a spreadsheet explaining to them that they were penalizing women for being uh, well, they not penalizing but it was not it was it actually cost a woman more to have a child if the more senior they were in the company, and they immediately did not want that. I mean, they, they're very, actually very, very progressive, which was wonderful. It was just explaining what was happening. But the thing that I look at, and I think every woman here and, and elsewhere, is there are sometimes maybe benefits or things that exist from other companies or things that you might happen in your life that help you, uh, set, you know, be successful, but maybe not may not be a benefit of your own company or may not exist in some place else and how do you like mentally track that and think about okay this is something that is enabling me and i'm getting this from this source how do i make sure that this gets proliferated more because this is going to help right and there are different ways that you can think about that but it's like keeping there's an uh, a vigilance that I think is to separate your own success, the things that are enabling you, and looking at those as, is there some way to, you know, I, and I, there are a lot of specifics, but I think that that's something that you constantly can be doing when, you know, at some level. Thank you very much. So I'd like you to thank you guys. Ladies, sorry. Thank you ladies very much. <laughs> that was an honest mistake, I didn't plan it. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank you very much for sharing your story, for putting in the time. I know you, some of you commuted, uh, so please uh, put it, give it up for, for the... Uh, we'll have you here for another while. Uh, I would like to thank our sponsors.